All right, let's get started. Welcome back to the wonderful world of reinforced concrete design. I hope you all had wonderful breaks. I know some of my ASC folks had some very busy breaks, or a busy break with the canoe. Um, quick up or quick review of how we did on the concrete canoe competition. We did very well. I should have included a picture, but I didn't really have time before class. Long story short, the canoe itself performed pretty well. Didn't crack, remember? Uh, uh, it, it performed great, and it, it, uh, it moved pretty well throughout the water. But um, we, during our co-ed race, we had a, a lot of people in the canoe. You know, there's four people in the canoe. And on some of the turns, just a little bit of water got in the canoe, you know, splashed in. And that was enough to sink it. So, yeah, but what's that? A little bit. Yeah, there was a little bit of cracking. But I usually, well, let's look at this. It was phenomenally improved from last year. Y'all did great. OK, um, let's do some housekeeping real quick. Um, so first off, um, home, just, just to make sure that everybody is clear as to where we're at with the grade, because it's been a while since we've met. So I figure let's just make sure everybody's clear on that. So homework number one through four and exam one is obviously graded. And that was where we were before break. Where we are today, homework number five is graded. You all have that right now in your hand. Homework number six uh, is currently being graded. Um, but I posted the solution for both of these on Blackboard. They're on right now. Now, you all have homework number seven. I didn't have room on the slide, so I left it off. But homework number seven has actually been assigned today, and it's due on Monday. Um, after today, you'll be able to do most of it. Um, and it's, it's not a very hard assignment. It can be a little bit tedious, but I think you'll see it's, it's a very doable assignment because uh, it's, it's, it's fairly straightforward. Um, what we're going to be talking about today is the concept of deflections. Now, I have a handout up here for example 15. That's what we're going to be doing today. This is a handout on the cracked moment of inertia. So if you haven't grabbed that, go ahead and grab that. Um, and then uh, I also have some leftovers for example 14. Now, we handed that out before break. So if you, um, uh, if you have, haven't gotten that, go ahead. But, you should already have that from for, for break anyways. Okay. Let's talk about deflections. Okay. So let's just sort of recap where we've gotten throughout this course. You know, we've done moments and we, we beat moments into the ground. You know, we did FMN and MU and then we did design of singly reinforced beams, design of doubly reinforced beams and T beams and every, every different moment consideration under the sun we handled. So we took care of moment. Shear we've taken care of. Now it's time to look at deflections. Okay. Now um, let's just sort of back up a little bit. Um, moment and shear were what we call strength limit states. Okay. And what I mean by that is if you violate a strength limit state, we're talking about the structure failing. We're talking about people's lives in danger. We're talking about imminent collapse. So the way that we handle that numerically is we start applying load factors. You know, we say 1.2 dead plus 1.6 live. We adjust our resistance by this fee value. And that's what those values are for to uh, adjust our supply and demand, if you will. I mean, think FMN is your supply and your loads are your demand. So throw some econ terms in there. But um, we adjust those with these special factors that take into account uncertainty. For instance, our live load factor is higher than the dead load factor because there's more uncertainty associated with it. And those are strength limit states. So what's a service limit state? Well, service limit state is not talking about, um, is, is not talking about imminent collapse. It's not a safety issue. Service limit states are intended to uh, control the structure's day-to-day -day performance. Okay? Does it deflect too much? Are, is there some cracking going on? Now, some of you might think, well, cracking isn't that bad. Well, I mean, you all know that you know, you've got a cracking moment, and then you've got FMN, and FMN is usually way larger than the cracking moment. Remember, there's only two types of concrete, and that's wet and cracked. So concrete is going to crack, and that just it is what it is. That's a joke, but, but not really. Um, but we're talking about things like excessive deflection, excessive vibration. Like if you've ever been on like a bridge, like you're stuck in traffic on a bridge and maybe the other lane's going and it vibrates and it feels a little 
uneasy? Have you ever been like that? that that's a service limit state. Um, and so when we're looking at service limit states, we're not thinking in the same terms as we are restraint. So one of the things that, we, that you all are going to have to get used to is when you're assessing service limit states, like deflections, you don't use load factors. Okay? So you're not doing 1.2 times the dead and 1.6 times the live because we're not talking about safety. We're not talking about a safety issue. We're just talking about day-to-day -day performance. So I wanted to sort of put that out there right now. When we start looking at deflection and we start doing the math, you're going to notice how the 1.2 times the dead and the 1.6 times the live, that those factors are just going to vanish because we don't need to apply them. We're not talking about safety. Now, um, in essence, in most structural engineering applications, by and large, the most critical or the most common type of service limit state that we uh, uh, evaluate is uh, deflections. Okay? In other words, there is a, a difference between whether or not the beam is going to fail under bending moment and whether or not it's just flexing too much. Um, and here, here's sort of an example. Okay? How many of you all have ever been in a building that has like a plastered roof, like plaster on the roof? You're, like probably your house has that or your, your parents' house, grandparents' house. You've probably seen that before, right? Well, there's a common structural deflection limit in buildings of L over 360, okay? In other words, you take the length of the beam, you divide it by 360, and so you've got to convert it to inches, and that'll tell you the maximum amount of deflection. And the reason why that deflection limit exists is because if you have more deflection than that, in other words, if the, the beam deflects more than that, the idea is that that will start to crack the plaster. And so that's why that deflection limit is there. Now, if you crack the plaster, does that mean that the whole structure is going to collapse? No, it doesn't mean the whole structure is going to collapse, but it's still not a desirable performance, right? So that's sort of what I mean when I say I want you to understand that there's a difference between you know, a strength limit state where if we start violating those, man, people are going to die, versus a service limit state where somebody's going to have to go and replaster the roof or, or something. Uh, so it, it still is, is something that we're going to, uh, uh, going to have to consider. All right. Now, nowadays, because we're, we've got, you know, high strength materials, you know, we, you're using better concretes and better steels uh, and whatnot, what, what, that in, what ends up uh, happening is that if all we were doing is looking at strength, we could probably design members that were fairly slender. You know, you know, better materials means the members themselves don't need to be as big. But you all should know from mechanics and structural analysis that remember your moment of inertia, the smaller the moment of inertia, the bigger your deflections are going to be, right? So just because we can use a smaller member from a strength standpoint doesn't mean that we're necessarily allowed to from a service standpoint. And so sometimes you'll have a beam and you'll have multiple limit states going on, you know, like it's moment, it's shear, and it's deflection, and one might be more critical than another. And so I think you'll kind of see where we're coming from uh, in the next little bit. Okay, now let's talk about deflections. First off, I want to make sure everybody remembers this. Have you seen this before? You've seen that before, right? I know you've seen that before because I'm the one that showed it to you. And I showed it to you in CE312, also called structural analysis. I even have that in the slide using the basics of CE312. So look, first off, this is in no way, shape, or form a repeat of structural analysis. Okay? I am not going to make you start uh, integrating little m times big M over EI to get a deflection. Okay? Mostly uh, what we're going to be dealing with is very simple loading scenarios. For instance, if I have a beam with a point load in the middle, I can determine the maximum deflection. You know, I can you know, alphabet soup that integral like crazy and get an, a value of PL cubed over 48 EI. Okay? You all should have that, um, that beam design guide that I gave you at the very beginning of the semester. It's also on Blackboard under the design aids and supplements. And it has all of the formulas for deflections for very basic loading scenarios. Spoiler alert, it's also in the steel manual as well um, in section three. But yes, I'm, I'm not going to make you redo this. I do want to emphasize, though, that 
if you needed to determine deflection for a loading case that wasn't quote unquote simple, you've got all the tools that you need in order to do that because I taught you how to do that last semester. So everybody sort of remember that? And this is also sort of what I was saying here. As the moment of inertia goes down, the deflection is going to go up. And so that's where that uh, strength versus service issue comes into play. Now, that doesn't, everything I've set up until now really doesn't have any bearing on reinforced concrete design. Has no bearing on that whatsoever. Um, what you're going to find is that in steel design, uh, the, for those of you that are either in it or are planning on taking it, deflections in steel design are demonstrably easier to handle than they are in here. And the reason why is because steel beams don't undergo cracking like concrete beams do. Okay, let's go back to some basics with um, with uh, with reinforced concrete design. Remember, I have a beam that is a singly reinforced concrete beam, and I've got some steel there. Doesn't really matter how much. And then I start applying moment to it. Once I hit the cracking moment, once I hit the cracking moment, what does this beam turn into? It turns into a beam that's got compression on the top, all the uh, concrete and tension on the bottom is essentially ineffective, and then remember in order to handle that we would turn that steel into an effective lump of concrete and compute, compute a cracked moment of inertia. Y'all remember that? Okay, so if we start thinking about this theoretically, here's where the concrete design comes in. Let's say I have a beam and the beam is subjected to some load, okay? So let's say the moment diagram looks something like that. To, to be honest, it really doesn't matter what the moment diagram looks like. I'm just trying to put something up here that's somewhat representative. Everybody in here has seen a moment diagram that looks something like that before, right? Well, it would stand to reason that some of these moments are going to exceed the cracking moment, and some of them are not, right? I mean, for instance, if here's the beam and the cracking moment is right here, then everything in between these points is going to experience cracking. Everything outside these points isn't, right? So in other words, some of the beams cracked, some of it isn't, okay? So when we perform our structural analysis, technically we shouldn't be using a beam that just has a constant cross-section. We should be using a beam that has sort of a stepped cross-section. In the middle, the beam should be smaller, right? That's technically what we should be doing. But the problem with that is that's hard, you know. There's a lot of integrals that you have to do. You have to, like for this, we just, we'd at least have to perform three integrals, if not more, if we had different loading scenarios and whatnot. And that would just be a pain for every problem that we do. Instead, we have sort of a way of around that. Instead of using a beam that has, you know, a smaller moment of inertia in the center and then a bigger moment of inertia at the ends, what we would do is we'd say, okay, here's the beam, and I'm, I'm just looking at the support right here. What we kind of do is we say, well, here's a, a bigger beam, here's a smaller beam. Let, so, so think, this, this first part of the beam is defined by a gross moment of inertia, and then this part of the beam is defined by a cracked moment of inertia. Instead, what we'll do is we'll kind of turn this into kind of like a beam that's somewhere in between this and this, sort of a, an equivalent, at, like a weighted average. And that cross-section is defined by what's called an effective moment of inertia. So if you want kind of an idea of what it would look like, it might look something like, like I don't know, like that, kind of like a weighted average. Does that make sense? So now the, the way that you compute that is right here. Um, it, it, it's, it's really not that difficult. You really only need four quantities to compute a, uh, a cracked moment of inertia. First off, here's, here's one thing I'll mention. The units are usually quite kind to you if everything's consistent. For instance, if your cracking moment and your applied moment are in the same units, everything cancels. And your moments of inertia, they're all usually in inches to the fourth anyway, so that works pretty well as well. So essentially the way this formula works, and I know it might be a little nasty, but a gross moment of inertia, or, or sorry, an effective moment of inertia is a weighted average. So the way you can think about it is an effective moment of inertia is a little bit of IG 
and a little bit of ICR. How much is that little bit? Well, it's defined by these fractions. So you need four quantities. You need a gross moment of inertia, you need a cracked moment of inertia, and that's sort of what's on that hand out there that I, that I uh, put, up, put up there. You need the cracking moment, and then you need the applied moment. And this is where I was saying right here, the applied moment is taken as service loads, so no load factors are applied, okay? Everybody okay with that? Any questions? Okay. Now, this is where you got to pay attention because this is where uh, students tend to make the most mistakes and tend to make the most conceptual mistakes as well. Not just calculation mistakes, but conceptual mistakes. Okay? So here's the thing. Beams never see live load by itself. They never see a live load by itself. Let's take a, a concrete beam, okay? So let's say I've got some columns right here, and I've got a corbel And so let's say that this is in a parking garage. I've got these columns set up, and I'm going to set a beam down on top of them. Okay? So I've got the crane, and let's say the beam's precast and whatnot. And so the first thing that happens is the beam is set in place. Right? Okay. What loads are present on that beam as it is? What's that? It's self-weight. Okay. So I would say that stage one of the beam, if you will, is seeing its dead load, right? Would you agree that under its dead load, probably we're going to have some cracking going on? Would that be a fair statement? Okay. Then what's going to happen? Well then I'm going to start putting live load on it. And that live load could be, I don't know if it was a parking garage, it could be cars, it could be people. If it was an office building, it would be us, the tables, the computers, the file cabinets, all that. That's, the, um, uh, that's going to be stage two. So in stage two, what loads are the, is the beam experiencing? No dead and live. It does so it never experiences the live load by itself, right? It always experiences either the dead load or the dead load plus the live load. Does that make sense? Okay. But here's the thing. You put more load on that beam, what's going to happen to the beam? More cracking. So for each of these load cases, you're going to yield a different IE, right? Does that make sense? Okay, here's the, here's the way this works, and this is, this is sort of why I'm getting at this. A lot of times our deflection limits are written in terms of live loads. The reason why is because usually in some way, shape, or form, we can either get around dead load deflection, uh, we can, uh, 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 you know, if this was steel, we could actually camber the beam so it's actually bent upward so when you sit it down, it actually sits flat. That's called cambering. If it's a precast element of concrete, you could actually even cast it that way. You could cast it with a little bit of upward camber so that if it sits down, it sits flat. Um, also, if you just have a really, really big reinforced concrete beam, the dead load deflections might be numerically themselves somewhat negligible that you might even be able to neglect it on the construction site. But it doesn't change the fact that your moment of inertia might, uh, will, uh, will be different. So ultimately, if you're trying to ask yourself what is the live load deflection? You cannot compute it directly. What you have to do is you have to compute the dead load deflection, compute the deflection of the dead load and the live load, and then take the difference of the two. Does that make sense? 
In other words, in stage one, let's say it had deflected a quarter of an inch, and then in, uh, after stage two, it deflected three quarters of an inch. So what that would tell you is that the live load caused that change in what, half an inch? Does that make sense? But you can't compute the live load deflection just on its own because you don't know what the moment of inertia is. There is no cracking attributing to, attributed to just the live load. It cracks due to the dead load and it cracks due to the dead plus the live load. Does that make sense? Everybody okay with that? All right, any questions? Then let's look at this example. I have a beam that uh, is 20 foot long. It's subjected to a uh, uh, distributed load. Uh, that's dead load and live. Um, I have a dead load of one kip per foot and a live load of 700 pounds per foot. It's 20 foot long and there are the beam dimensions. Now, I am curious. We are going to be calculating deflections. Does anybody know what the maximum deflection for a load case like this is? Does anybody know? If you don't know, where would you find that out? Then they have their beam handout handy. Remember this? Anybody have that with them? You should have it with you. All right. What is the maximum deflection for this case? Well, would you agree this is the case that we're looking at? We have a, a simply supported beam subjected to a uniformly distributed load, right? Um, let me drag over a little bit. Does the moment look right? Moments WL squared over 8, right? So what about deflection? Well, it makes sense that the maximum deflection is at the center, right? And that deflection is computed as 5 WL to the fourth over 384 EI. Do you all remember that formula from structural analysis? I know I'm pretty sure we derived that at some point, um, or I think I made you all do that on a homework assignment. But long story short, that's, that's going to be probably the most common formula that we use for deflections. That's the deflection for a uh, simply supported beam subjected to a uniformly distributed load. So here's the beam. And here's the load on top of it. So it's probably going to deflect something like that. And that's how you compute that delta max. Everybody okay with that? Now I'm going to work off the screen for the most part. I just wanted this formula handy so that when I start plugging and chugging, you're like, where did you get that formula? Well, there's where I got it. So is everybody okay with that? And if you have a different loading scenario, um, for instance, uh, let's say you have a you know, triangular load. I know the formula is a little nastier, but there's how you compute it. So, Okay, I'll leave you all to that. Let's pull up a notebook. Okay. Okay. So let's start off with what we know about the beam. So let's start off with the beam's geometry, and I mean it's geometry from a structural analysis standpoint. We know that the length of the beam is 20 feet long. It's subjected to a dead load of 1.0 kips per foot. And that includes the self-weight, keep that in mind. And it's subjected to a live load of 0 0.7 kips per foot. Now, the beam itself is 12 inches wide. It has an effective depth of 17 inches. And its height is 20 inches. Now, 
Its area of steel is three. Its FC prime is three KSI. Now this is normal weight concrete, so what does that mean? Yeah, there we go. And then we have 60 KSI, Ooh. We have 60 KSI steel, although that actually doesn't matter for this problem. Okay, sound good? All right, now, remind me, there were four parameters that we needed for, uh, for the, the effective moment of inertia. Now, one of those parameters, let, let's just start listing them. Does anybody remember those four parameters right offhand? Or four quantities for the effective moment of inertia. Does anybody remember them? So we need the cracking moment. What else? The applied moment. Uh, well, so we need the cracking moment. Sorry, yeah, cracking moment. We need the gross moment of inertia and the crack moment of inertia. Those are the four parameters we need to compute an effective moment of inertia. We need that effective moment of inertia to do this. So let's take each of these one at a time. Let's start off with the easiest. Let's start off with the gross moment of inertia. Does anybody remember how to compute the gross moment of inertia for a beam like this? It's BH cubed over 12, right? That, that one's easy, right? Now, if it was a T-beam or some beam that's a weird shape, we'd have to break out the parallel axis theorem. But for this, it's pretty simple. So, So what does this come out to be? Do I have a second on that? Although, it's pretty easy. The 12's cancel, and so it's 20 cubed. 20 times 20 is 400, times another 20 is 8,000. That one's pretty easy, right? Okay. Um, what about the cracked moment of inertia? Y'all remember how to do that? Let's pull up that handout I, sent, uh, uh, I gave you. The reason I gave you this handout is because, quite frankly, this is something that we've done before, and it's just, it just takes a while. Okay? So let, let's take a look at this. So here's the beam. and set, So first thing I noted, I said that the gross moment of inertia is 8,000. Now, the reason that I put that the gross moment of inertia is 8,000, I'm going to write that up here is because when you compare the cracked moment of inertia to that, what is always the case? Think about it. If you have a gross moment of inertia and a cracked moment of inertia for any beam and under any circumstance, what can you tell me about those two numbers? The, cr the gross moment of inertia should be bigger than the cracked moment of inertia or vice versa. The cracked moment of inertia should be less because if the beam's cracked, it's weaker, right? So I put that up there just as a mental check on your math. You know, I got 8,000 for the gross moment of inertia. My cracked moment of inertia better be less than 8,000 when this is all said and done. So it's a check to make sure that your numbers are coming out right. Okay, so here's the transformed section. So I've got a beam that's 12 inches wide that has a 17-inch effective depth, and I'm turning that into a beam that has, uh, has a compression block up top and on the bottom, uh, there's no concrete, and we just turn that uh, steel into an effective lump of concrete uh, uh, as follows. And so ultimately what we have to do is we have to determine a centroid, you know, like sum of AX over sum of A. So basically I'm summing moments about that neutral axis. So if I look above that neutral axis, what's the area of this box? Well, it's 12 times X, and what's the moment arm? How far is it from this neutral axis to the center of that block? I'm asking you. How far is it from the center neutral axis to the center of that block? X over 2. All right, so we have this area down here. It's just 27. Now, how did I get 27? Um, 
I have a typo here where this says area of steel is nine square inches. That's supposed to be three square inches. Whoops. Yeah, this part right here, that's three square inches. Whoops. So that's three square inches. So if this is three square inches, how do I get this is 27? Well, I have to compute my uh, modular ratio. Remember the modular ratio is the modulus of elasticity of steel divided by the modulus of elasticity of the concrete, right? So what's the modulus of elasticity of steel? It's 29 million PSI. Why am I using PSI? Because to get the modulus of elasticity of concrete, it's 57,000 times the square root of FC prime. But remember how the square root of FC prime works. You put in PSI, you get out PSI. So everything's got to be in PSI. So you plug and chug, and that comes out to about 9.29. So we just round that and say it's 9. So that's how I'm getting this. This is 9 times 3, and that's 27. Everybody okay with that? So what I do is I sum those moments. So I've got, you know, 12x times x over 2 has got to equal 27 times the quantity 17 minus x. And this is where your algebra comes into play, right? So on the left, 12x times x over 2 is 6x squared. And then 27 times 17 minus x, the 27 times 17 is 459, and then the 27x. So I get a quadratic equation. Do I need to go through how to take this equation and solve for x? I think by now you should be good with that. So there's two answers. 6.7812 and then a negative answer. The negative answer doesn't make any sense. So that's our x distance. Hold on. Oh. Then we have our, basically our parallel axis theorem, i plus ad squared. You know, before we would have a column with a's and y's and ay's and i naughts. We don't need to determine where the centroid is because we know where the centroid is. It's right here. So that table's a lot smaller. We have for the concrete, here's the moment of inertia, bx cubed over 12. Here's the area, bx. The d is the centroid distance, x over 2, so i plus ad squared. Now remember, there's no i value for that little lump of uh, concrete. You know, we turn the steel into an effective lump of concrete. There's no i value, but there is an a value and a d value. Hence how you get i plus ad squared. You get an ad squared term in. So when you sum that up, you get like 40, 66 point like 77. So I just went ahead and called the cracked moment of inertia 4067. Now did that value make sense? Yeah, that value made sense. That value made sense because it's less than this. The beam has cracked, so it should be weaker. Okay. Now, what else can you tell me? Let me ask you this. Here's the gross moment of inertia. Here's the cracked moment of inertia. What can you tell me about the effective moment of inertia? It should be between those two values, right? Those are the two extremes, a beam that's completely intact and a beam that's completely cracked. So when you compute an effective moment of inertia, it should be somewhere in between. But here's the thing, you're going to compute multiple effective moments of inertia for each different load case. But I digress. Okay. Sound good? Okay, so here's how I'll, I'll put this on your notes. Is I'll say, okay, the gross moment of inertia is this, the cracked moment of inertia is just 4067. And I'll say like from handout. Woo. Now, so let's look at this. Have we handled, we've handled two of them, right? What about the cracking moment? Anybody remember how to compute the cracking moment? You've done it before.
Everybody's looking at me like, I remember that, but that was a long time ago. Well, we just got back from spring break. We forgot that we were even in this class until our phone said, oh, damn, we got class in 10 minutes. Remember that? Y'all remember this? The cracked moment of, or the cracking moment is FR times IG over YT. Now, what's FR? And, and how do you compute that? Correctly? Yes. <laughs> uh, you're close. 7.5 times lambda times the square root of FC prime times IG over YT. Now what's YT? It's an H over 2 for a rectangular section. Remember it's from your centroid to the very, 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 very bottom, that extreme fiber distance. And for a rectangular beam we know where the centroid is and so that's just half the height. So we'll call this 0.5 H. So we can start plugging and chugging. So, whoop, my screen's tilting. So we have 7.5 times 1 times, uh, I'm actually going to swap this. I'm going to say this is 8,000 inches to the fourth, and I'm going to put the square root over here, and this is 3,000 PSI and this is 0 0.5 and then is it 20 inches tall? Okay, and so what does this come out to be? Spoiler alert, it should be a pretty big number numerically. Say it again. 328. I hit the three, I swear I did. 328633. 0.5. Do I have a second on that? Okay. Um, now, what are the units? Inch pounds. This is a moment. So how many foot kips is that? How would you determine how many foot kips that is? What's that? Divide by 12,000. Remember, divide by 12 to get the inches to feet. Divide by 1,000 to get the pounds to kips. So that divided by 12,000 is what? 27.39 foot kips. Do I have a second on that? Is everybody okay with this so far? Okay, all right, so would you agree with this box? Would you agree with that? Okay, these three values are pretty important when you're doing a deflection problem. They're pretty important because they don't change from case to case. Remember, we're going to have like a case of just the dead loads and a case of the dead loads plus the live loads. And for each of those cases, those values don't change. But what is going to change from case to case? Well, not the, well, the moment of the effective moment of inertia, but what else is going to change? What's the fourth parameter? The applied moment. The MA is going to change. So you're going to have a different MA here than you are here. See, here, here's what I'm getting at. The applied moment for just the dead load for case one is going to be MD, which is WL squared over 8. But the MA for case 2 with the dead load plus the live load, so we'll call this MA1 and MA2 just for the sake of what we're talking about on the board, is going to be the dead load plus the live load. So it's going to be this, right? And so for each case, that is going to yield a different effective moment of inertia. These three values are going to stay the same, but the applied moments are going to be different. Does that make sense?
Is everybody okay with that? Yes. So why in the I mean I understand you don't Because what we're talking about isn't a safety issue. All we're asking is how much does the beam deflect in the end. If it deflects too much, eh, it sucks, but it doesn't mean the, the building's going to fall down. It doesn't mean it's going to kill people. It's just going to cost a lot of money. It's a good question. All right. Is everybody okay with this concept? Okay. All right. So here's how this is going to work. We're going to start off. I said dead, not did. D E D dead. What's that off of? It's off of something. Okay. So you'll you'll see how this works. I, that's gonna bug me though. I gotta find out what that's off of. Somebody's if I had comments on is gonna leave a comment. So that's what that's off of. Okay. So we're going we're gonna to have, uh, first off, our applied moment for the dead loads. Now, how much dead load was on this beam? One kit per foot. And this is 20 feet squared over 8. And so how much is that? 50 foot kits. Looking at that number, is, has the beam experienced any t sort of cracking at all? Make sure everybody's paying attention. You're shaking your head yes. Why? Because it's higher than the cracking moment, right? Remember, the, the bending moment diagram is going to look something like that, and that's 50, right? But 27.39 is probably going to be like somewhere right there. So I propose that anything between here and here is cracked, right? That's a cracked portion of the beam. Okay, just make sure everybody's paying attention. All right. Now, the effective moment of inertia is computed as follows. And just make sure that you're paying attention to the formula because there's one thing that's really easy to miss. Okay, it is the cracking moment over MA cubed, there, that's a cubed there, times IG plus 1 minus that fraction times I cracking, or times the crack moment of inertia. Now, here's the thing. For this calculation, for this one right here, our MA is 50. And it's in the correct units because this is in foot kips and that's in foot kips. So instead of writing all this out, I'm just going to let you plug and chug and tell me what you get. Forty-seven, thirteen point five. What? What are the units? It's a moment of inertia. So, inches to the fourth. Do I have a second on that value? While you, some people are, are seconding, does that value make sense? Why are some people shaking your head? Yes. Exactly. It's between your two extremes. It's between the gross moment of inertia and the crack moment of inertia. Now, what we now need to do is we need to compute a deflection. So we're going to compute the deflection due to the dead load. And that's going to be 5 W L to the fourth over 384 E times I E. Now, I actually did not compute E off to the side, so let me go ahead and do that right here. All right. Now, E's are typically in KSI, right? So E is 57,000 
square root of FC prime, so that's 57,000 times the square root of 3,000 TSI, and that equals what? Anybody got an answer? PSI, and so that's just going to be 3122 KSI. I'm putting that in KSI because everything else is in KIPS, okay? So let's plug and chug. Let's see. Now, I don't think it takes a lot of attention to recognize we got a mess here with units. I'm curious if anybody remembers how to fix it. We're computing a deflection, 1728. Remember? We have a, a simple conversion factor for deflections at 1728 for rotations, 144 times 180 over pi. So this is, because that's from last semester. Now what does that come out to be? Say it again. Did, give me three decimal places. 0 0.245. Everybody okay with that? So under dead load, this beam deflects about a quarter of an inch, right? So how do you determine live load deflection? Well, you don't determine it directly. What you do is everything for these three lines, the MA, the IE, and this, you do it again, only instead of using dead load, you use dead plus live load. So you're going to have a higher moment, which is going to yield a lower IE, and it's going to yield a different deflection. If you want to see if you're on board with this, I would actually try that out between now and Wednesday. It takes like 30 seconds, but I would try it out and see what you get. Um, I can tell you, I'll give you a couple spoiler alerts. The moment is higher. This is lower, but it's still between these two values. That'll always be the case if you're doing your math right. Check and see what you get. But that's all I've got because I'm actually officially out of time. But let me sort of show you where we're headed. So this problem, and, and I actually really didn't mention this at the beginning, but because um, it's actually sort of the title of the lecture. But what we have done um, is compute what are called immediate deflections or instantaneous deflections. What I mean by that is I have a beam, I put some load on it, here's the deflection right now. Okay? Now let's take this parking garage example. What happens if I take that load and I leave it there for 30 years? Concrete properties change over time. And as a result, your deflections will change over time. So there is a difference between immediate deflections and long-term deflections, deflections that last a long time. And we're going to talk about that next time. We're going to finish this example next time, and then we're going to talk about long-term deflections uh, when we uh, get back on Wednesday. That's all I have, everybody. I will see you, or at least most of you, in about 10 minutes. So.